So I'm here with Casey from Small Act, and Casey and I met, we met last year at the Nonprofit Technology Conference. Yep, in person. Yep, yep that was the first time. Perfect. And then we're, you're going to be there this year too, right? Yes, absolutely. For people who don't know, Small Act, the way that I describe Small Act is that it's a way for um, nonprofits really to see, to mm -hmm. connect the dots between their database, their community, and the network. You know, yep. social media, what's happening there, and how that relates to their donors, their subscribers, their volunteers, right? Do, do yeah, you, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Do you want to add to that or? Yeah, no, I, mean, I think it, you know, just to that to that point, it's just kind of helping bring together all of the pieces with the ever-changing social mm -hmm. um, media spaces, um, as well as the highly structured CRM spaces, and how do you get that data to work together to help, you know, people be better fundraisers, advocates, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, um, people events. So, so it's really kind of helping people just get more insight mm. um, that they've never been able to get before. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So that's exactly what I want to talk about today. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Now, <laughs> so one, um, I often get into conversations about Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff. And the one theme that comes up is that you really can't identify people. There's no way to segment. In email, you know, email marketing, you can easily segment people based exactly. on their behavior, based on their interests. But social media by default, you know, especially something like Facebook, you really yeah. can't identify people based on their actions. So. Um, and Facebook, unfortunately, doesn't let you drill down into insights where you can actually see individual people. You can't exactly. ca create yep. lists of people. Like, these are your top yep. fans. You just can't do that. So I was curious to just talk about why would an organization care about segmenting their Facebook fans? Why would they care? What would the value be? In terms of the, the way that I think nonprofits actually have a... Um, a very unique opportunity that's more powerful than a commercial brand is Coke or something like that is that they already know these people and so so the way our service works um, and, and there can be others too is that um, we go from their email and find out who exists on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn etc and the reason that's important is that then we have the path back to their historical actions with the organization and so one of the examples um, uh, just that we were actually working with CARE is after we did um, this um, kind of profiling um, in the sense in, in just understanding where these people exist, figuring out all of the people who had done an advocacy action in the last 12 months who were also on Facebook. So if Facebook won't tell them that, but through doing some of the, and actually referred them to you as well um, in, in your site, taking that email list, getting that into Facebook and advertising to those people or promoting something to those people is very germane because it's, it's and they can be very specific about taking advocacy action on Facebook or through Facebook versus another set, you know, donors over $1,000 who are also on Facebook. Then they can market to them. Two things, they can market to them in Facebook through that they can upload a list of emails, right, um, to of people they want to promote um, some advertising to. Um, but then the other side, um, they're also getting more sophisticated now through taking the email approach um, to those people. So if they know that they exist on a platform, they're pretty active, and they have had these historical things like they have taken advocacy actions or donated a certain level, they'll actually change the email um, subject and body content because they know the person is at least social. Right, and they're on Facebook. They'd be very specific about even embedding something that goes right to Facebook. So they're really so um, they and also WGBH in Boston. Um, they are starting to modify their emails based upon where these people are socially, so they can optimize their performance. So one thing that you said, um, which really kind of caught me, um, my interest was looking at the historical behavior. If it's one thing that's true about people. In general, because you know, social media really is not about the internet at all. It's about people and how they behave, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and one thing that's true is that it, it, this may sound kind of pessimistic, but basically, people don't change, right? The behavior yeah. that they did last week, the patterns, the beliefs, the the approaches, the things they click on, are probably going to be very similar to what they'll do in the future. So, yeah. if you have the ability to go back and say and and look at how people responded to content or what content yeah. what content actually leads someone down a path to sign a petition or leads yeah. someone down a path to sign up as a volunteer 
with Facebook alone, you can't determine that. You can't. You can just say, oh, this right. update did really well. But you can't really tie it back. You can say, oh, this got a lot of comments, likes, and shares. But you really can't tie that back to the, yeah. these are the updates that were instrumental in leading this group of people down yeah. a path to sign a petition or to volunteer yeah. or to donate. Exactly. And I think that's completely sort of on target because for care, right, maybe there's a different country sort of issue, right, that these specific set of their audience were really passionate about will market to them about that same thing, something new, something different. But like you said, that is right in line with what you already know that they're emotionally connected to um, because it's it's the the biggest door that, that's wide open, but right now it's disconnected. And I think that's really where um, Facebook becomes a hugely uh, powerful marketing channel when you have these segments and you can't get them from Facebook but if you organize your segments and your audiences before going into Facebook then you know and, and it's that sort of you know um, really cool technology too that you describe and, and, and show people where if I know you donated to um, Zimbabwe right I can at least do an advertisement to the people that you know also because maybe maybe they haven't connected there but there's more than likely a chance that your connection with that as well as they'll be more likely to like that than just the general audience. So there's some really cool innovative ways to use that. Um, and the other um, aspect too, I think this um, also um, is very powerful organizations where like you said, historical actions and interests um, evolve, right? They don't dramatically change one day to another. They might sort of alter from time to time but very similar. The one thing that's interesting though is by understanding um, how a person behaves socially also, um, we can help organizations find the best way to engage them. And the example that I, uh, we're seeing is for sustainer gifts, right? So like one of the key indicators in terms of all the other data points that um, may give some insight is if they're web savvy and can do online transactions easily. Right. So for us, when we look at a, a database of people and we see, oh, this specific set of people um, has no inhibitions online whatsoever and they're at the right point in their cycle. So what we can help them do is to figure out their ideal sustainer candidates. And so in um, so TPT, um, the PBS station in, in uh, St. Louis, they um, are also doing something similar where they say, OK, instead of just asking for one hundred twenty dollars, we're going to go after these people for $15 a month because it is more likely that it fits their um, sort of persona, their behaviors um, socially, and it's actually a good, it's a 50% you know, bump in revenue. Um, so there's different ways to combine just their behavior socially with the particular campaigns and resources. And then other ones would be people who um, are more professional, who are sort of managers, directors, VPs, etc. The example that um, that someone told well, I, I I talked to the guy who was a um, VP at Booz Allen right um, and World Wildlife kept just sending him an annual solicitation for fifty dollars each year and so he's like I'll give him fifty bucks because that's what they asked but I could certainly give more and then just one other thing when we look at the people who are in the database we can also listen if they discuss certain topics um, or if they if they have them in their bio. And so the, all of that being said, we're helping them identify um, parents so that when they, they're actually going to do a telemarketing campaign, it, sort of, um, they're going to sort of do unspecialized for parents that they can talk about, you know, Curious George and Wild Kratz and all those sort of like age appropriate things because for people like me, that's the way to get me to be more active. It's more relevant to me. It's a better conversation. It's not weird or awkward. It's great. Right, that's what I want to be involved with, and they're more sophisticated because they know what I care about. Um, so it's a more productive conversation. There's different ways to use it, in you know, sort of more general advertising and marketing and and so on. But one example is for NWF when their their COO she was going up to New York to visit someone face to face, and I I do believe that um, social is not intended to replace um, any existing means of relationship building. Right, and so when the major gift officers, it's not about getting them to tweet; it's about helping them understand their donors and prospects better to make a more relevant conversation for both parties. So her example was 
how to in in the post he only had like ten tweets right so really not an active t Twitter folk um, but two of them were about climate control so of all the range of possible things that she could talk to him about when she took the train up to New York it was about climate right well how do you feel about that what are the areas and and so here's some special programs we have that deal with deforestation that is really impacting the climate issues and, and that's exactly what he probably cares about. Yeah, it, you know, it's amazing how many um, you know people asking for lots of money. You know, like a like a big donation. It's amazing how much they actually don't do any homework at all. Yeah, you know, they just call you because you're on a list. You know. Yeah. But but that first impression is going to be really important. So. Yeah, and it's kind of the same thing. It's like the same understanding, and and I really believe that that understanding a person's passion and their current interests really makes it relevant. So if, if it's world wildlife, well here's what I care about for kids. It's like getting kids into um, sort of experience outdoor things, right, and animals. Um, that too, like on a one-to-one -one level, that's really useful, but also in a broad sense, it's the same data but just used on a sort of more broad approach. And one thing that um, uh, University of Central Florida is um, working on is they're going to be doing a um, blitz campaign um, similar to how FSU had like a single day fundraiser type of thing. They're um, focusing on the um, key influential people like socially. First, there's 600 of them, a personal call. They're going to call all 600 people even though they're looking for social outcomes. A call to build that relationship and kind of get them on board to till the soil before the launch actually happens. So there's all different ways from a broad approach like TPT for for kids or for interests or um, different uh, like wildlife related things for different programs, um, but it's also high touch. You know, it's so it's all of it kind of comes under the umbrella of relevancy to the right stuff to the right people at the right time. So a lot of what we're talking about is great, okay. But what kind of advice would you give to the small to medium sized nonprofit? Who they're they're watching this video right now and they're saying, "Wow, you know what? I love these ideas." Uh, where do I start? How do I actually start looking at, you know, my Twitter followers or my Google Plus people or my Pinterest people? That guy. like, where, where? What would be maybe the first three things to do, to actually start, you know, going down this path of making sense of your followers and your fans and identifying the right people? A couple things and. In terms of understanding where they are, there's um, some different methods because there's all there's always the concern about you, you know, do we have the, the resources to man this effort, and that and especially with the small ones, that's that's a concern because um, there's you know they wear so many different hats, um, and so um, for for people starting out, I think there's a couple of things to do um, instead of worrying about necessarily all of the people, pick your top ten you know on whatever platform and just really dive into relationships with them because it's more important to have high quality relationships than a high number um, especially in that in that setting so whether it is Pinterest or Google Plus or Twitter or Facebook just really dive in and then sort of say hey we've been talking on Facebook before but I'd like to have a call with you just to get to know you better um, just different ways that you know sort of different 15 minute 30 minute things you can do to really kind of step up to understand why they support you, you know, what is it about them that they're passionate about for your organization. So it's both a relationship building but also learning exercise um, would be one. Um, the, the other thing, um, and, and this is just something that we're doing specifically for small organizations, um, when we have our um, uh, product launch, we're actually allowing, it's sort of like Dropbox, right, and, and in the sense that um, we're giving free accounts to people so they can profile um, up to a thousand people. Um, for free. So, because we want to give them a jump start, the new website that we're launching is called socialvision.io. When you were t talking earlier, I started thinking about this idea of influence, you know, with mm -hmm. clout scores and all that stuff. Yep. I, I think influence um, is over, well, it, I think it's kind of overrated to some degree because I agree. What, what's more important, I think, is interest. So, the influence, totally. you know, I'm Chris Brogan and I have 200 thousand million people on Twitter, whatever, right. you know, but is Chris specifically involved in cerebral palsy? Is he, is he right. really interested in that? Is he directly impacted by that? Maybe not, yeah. you know? Yeah. So he may, he may send out a retweet, maybe, because he's a nice guy, yeah. you know, right. but you're really not going to have a long-term deep relationship with Chris Brogan 
um, because Correct. he may not he doesn't have the passion that's not necessarily his interest so yeah. you know I think where you're going is, is is find the people that are already on your side you just don't really know you haven't really identified who they are and maybe a maybe a way to segment them or organize them. yeah yeah and, and part of our earlier conversation about resources right there's so many undiscovered resources that you already have um, of people who have already given you their heart right that's one of the hardest things to win you've already got that um, just use what their talents are their skill sets and understanding them and another good example is um, National Wildlife Federation they are doing a um, hike and seek right for kids outdoor um, uh, kind of education they looked for the people who were influential that's part of the deal but this one in particular was a kindergarten teacher that had kinder chat every Monday at 9 p.m. and so for her it wasn't just about wildlife it was about kids and wildlife so to your point when you do engage with these people it's not she could talk about anything she could talk about sort of cars or planes or whatever it's not going to even resonate with her audience either right if it's not about kids and so this was a perfect setting because the program of kids outdoors exactly matched up what she really cared about she was passionate about it and really was something that was important to her and the people who um, listen to her or subscribe to her right follow her so I think that's a really important part of when you do find these influential people what's in it for them right as much as an organization wants to sort of you know kind of force feed in some in some cases they're, they're getting much more sophisticated now um, what's in it for the donor or what's in it for the social advocate like why do they do that and that's again that 10-15 minute conversation you know opening that up and you can always find ways to sort of combine in, in um, their passion with helping you achieve something for your organization so I think that's a really important and, and I, I agree with you um, on the sort of whole influential thing it's not just getting a retweet it's, it's their passion and love for what you do and one of the other things that we're going to be releasing as well is um, in the new platform is a uh, passion indicator and an affinity indicator index so that if they're passionate about wildlife they just don't tweet with you much well that's still good right because they're, they're passionate about the subject matter just you need to engage them in the right way and the affinity affinity is how engaged with you are they right so kind of combining um, different you know ways like subject matter um, as well as you know directly with your organization figuring that out to kind of help kind of you know build you know the right type of engagement for the right people as well